So I'm guessing that you have moments in your life when things are going well. You feel as though you're in good health. You have energy to spare. Your schedule has eased up somewhat. You have a break from your studies, your papers, your deadlines, maybe. Maybe you're in a moment when family and friends are doing as well as they can. Everything is feeling copacetic. And you probably, every now and then, have these ain't life grand moments. Well, at least I hope you do, because we all deserve them. And I think it's possible for us to have even glimmers of moments like that. But of course, there are other times. There are times when we struggle. There are times when we, we don't know if we have the strength to carry on. And maybe you get fearful that you might actually be inadequate to handle your circumstance. And that fear can be debilitating. That fear can cause you to stand still in the midst of your storm. And truth be told, we probably feel inadequate anyway, even when we're having those great moments, even when things are going good. But somehow that inadequacy, we manage to push down and we hide it away and we smile and put on an everything's okay face. But mm, in challenging moments, that feeling of lack of strength, that fear that might paralyze you, that it just emerges again and you feel even more inadequate. And what makes it difficult or more difficult is we can carry that sense of limitation that we have for ourselves. We can carry that sense of being alone into our faith journey. And we can carry that into underestimating what God can do with us and through us. And you know, I think, I think the disciples, they did this too. I want to share with you the reading from scripture that we're going to look at today. The very first verse says, And on that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. So hold on to that other boats with, with him idea for now. On that day, that is the day that Jesus was telling a bunch of parables. parables. That is the day that we heard the story that we heard last week, the story of the sower planting seeds, the story of the man that did work but also took rest. That is the day that we heard the story about the kingdom of God being like a mustard seed, the day that he talked about this radical, inclusive love of God that the kingdom was about to bring. And he also taught a lot more parables before those that we heard last week. On that day, those three words connect the events of Jesus' teaching all day long to then going into that boat to cross the Sea of Galilee. It's emphasizing the continuity of events, that long day of ministry that Jesus had. They had seen him all day teaching. And as you're going you're gonna to learn soon that what his followers, including his 12 disciples, the one who got into that boat with him, saw was Jesus as a great teacher. But they didn't fully grasp who he was. They didn't understand that he had a divine nature too. They limited him to a human nature that they saw. Which is why I think Mark took this time to add that odd little line that says, they took him with them in their boat just as he was. Just as he was? What exactly was he? I'm thinking it was a hot day, probably like yesterday and the day before that. And I'm thinking he probably was smelling a bit off. Think about it. Think about it. He was out all day. He had a crowd of people constantly following him. He didn't get a chance to freshen up. He didn't go say, mm, let me go take a dip in the Sea of Galilee first. No, he said, we're done teaching. Let's get into the boat. Now, if you have a divine only 
or a high ass image of Jesus. That might offend you. You're like, no, this is Jesus. Jesus doesn't smell. Jesus doesn't sweat. Jesus doesn't need a bath, does he? Does he need food? Does he need sleep? Well, you know he did. That was his human side of him. And you know it because the witnesses who were with him said that he did. And on that day, after a long day of teaching, when he was probably smelly, he was also probably exhausted, physically drained, and in need of rest. Maybe he didn't even get an opportunity to eat. Maybe he was hungry. Maybe he could have done with a Snickers bar or some good roasted fish. He was, after all, fully human. And it is that human side that the disciples see. They have seen that he is tired. They have seen that he needs time alone sometimes. They have seen him hungry. But they've also seen him primarily as this rabbi, this fantastic teacher, somebody deeply spiritual and somebody wise, but somebody human. And although they had seen his miraculous works and his, and his heard his teachings, they didn't really fully grasp that he was something else. He had this divine side to him. Their familiarity with his human needs led them to underestimate his divine authority and power over creation. They could not fully see him. They could not see him fully. And as you're going to read, they could not trust him deeply. They expected him to be their protector and their leader, even in his tired state. But I don't think they even knew what that meant. And in many ways, this uncertainty of how they see Jesus is, I think, how we have this uncertainty of what to expect of Jesus and what to expect of God. How are we supposed to expect God to, to, to look at our circumstances? How are we expecting God to be present and attend to our sufferings? How are we supposed to deeply trust God? Our expectation of God is to be present in our lives and our wake to our sufferings. But how many of us really believe that? Many of us don't because we see this world, oh, this world full of chaos. We see this world of chaos that spills into our safe spaces and we don't see God as doing anything, not always anyway. We don't see God as a God who is unlimited. And as I'm going to try and repeat to you to see Jesus fully is to trust God deeply, or to see God fully is to trust God deeply. Faith in Jesus, especially in tumultuous times, is difficult, but I think it can lead to a deeper understanding of his power and presence. Here's what happens next. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Well, that's not good. The boat, the thing that was supposed to keep them away from the waters, provide this division, was suddenly being filled with water. The chaos and the danger that's associated with with the sea that the Jewish people believed in, was entering their space. For the disciples, this boat was a place of familiarity, a place of trust. But the storm, the storm took away that. The boat wasn't safe anymore. The boat wasn't a trusted space anymore. The boat was being filled with the chaos and with the fear and with the panic. And I think we all, of course, can relate to that. Our safe spaces today are being filled with chaos, whether they're our homes, whether they're our workplaces, our communities, even our mental and emotional states can sometimes feel overwhelmed by the storms of life. And you know, you know the, the many forms these storms can take. We have personal crises, our health issues uh, can change on a dime, we can get a sudden diagnosis of illness, it can shake our sense of safety and well-being. Everything that we thought was okay in our world gets flipped over. We can have unexpected financial troubles, like losing a job 
or we have unexpected expenses that come out of nowhere and they threaten our sense of security and stability. We can have relationship conflicts, strained relationships with family members or colleagues, people that we once thought were our support system causes us stress and anxiety. We have divorces, we have breakups, we have conflicts with families over politics that can swamp our emotional and safe spaces. Our storms can be our mental or emotional struggles. Anxiety, depression, and other mental challenges can make our minds feel like turbulent places. They swamp our, our sense of well-being, our inner peace and our stability, and we toss and turn at night. There is, of course, a storm of global and societal issues, natural disasters, the pandemic, political instability, societal unrest, all the, all the fighting that we see in all of the world can cause chaos that seeps into our personal lives. There's so many storms, so many that can overwhelm us, overwhelm our sense of community, and overwhelm our secure sense of security. And when our safe spaces are being swamped by chaos, we often are left feeling frightened and helpless and inadequate much like the disciples in that storm. The odd thing is the disciples, some of them were fishermen. Some of them were experts on the sea. Some of them had endured storms before. And yet, these people, all in this boat, stood paralyzed with fear as to what to do next. They were unable to lean out to each other, to the other people in the boat, for support. They were unable, in their fear, to turn to each other and say, we're not alone in this. They were unable to navigate themselves out of the chaos. They had each other in the boat. They had the other boats around them. Remember, they weren't alone. But I think that just like the disciples, even if we are well-equipped, even if we are not alone, when fear strikes us, we, we forget that we are not alone. We feel alone. We feel that we are unable to handle our storms with each other. Fear can make us feel inadequate. And our fear can make God feel inadequate as well. And in these, in these moments, it's, easy, it's so easy to question God. Do you not care, God? Are you here, God? Just as the disciples did when they woke Jesus. Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? We are in this horrible circumstance, and what are you doing? You're asleep. You've been made yourself comfortable. You've got a cushion, and you've put yourself to sleep, and, and we are in a circumstance that makes us feel out of control. Are you worth it, Jesus? Because we've been following you around for days. We have given up our lives for you. We've been serving you. We've been listening to you teach Heck, we even got into the boat in the middle of the night for you. And when we need you, when you're, we are in a crisis, you are asleep. And I bet they're thinking, what the heck? Is this worth it? Is this following Jesus thing worth it? Given the circumstances, is Jesus enough? And I bet you've probably thought that too. Given your circumstance, is Jesus enough? Or is Jesus simply asleep at the stern of our chaos, too? I think the reaction, of course, is a natural human response to our fear and our uncertainty. But it also serves as a reminder that we can and we do underestimate God's power and God's ability to bring peace into our chaos. They saw him just as he was, a good teacher. And that's what they called him, teacher, do you not care? Not good son of God, not divine one, not person who can perform miracles. No, teacher. Smelly, tired, hangry teacher. Do you not care? That is limiting Jesus. That is not seeing Jesus fully. That is not trusting God deeply. And I think that even says, when you cannot trust Jesus deeply, when you cannot trust God deeply, 
it leads you to not trusting others as well, which is why they didn't turn to each other and say, let's get help each other. We are not alone. Let's do what we can. It's not wrong to turn to God to help, but it often leads us to feeling alone. To see God fully is to trust God deeply. And to trust God deeply is to trust those who God has made in God's image. Let's continue. And waking up, he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, be silent, be still. And then the wind ceased and there was dead calm. You know what I appreciate about this verse? Is what Jesus did not do. When they go to Jesus and they go, Jesus, oh my goodness, Jesus, you gotta wake up, gotta wake up. There's a big storm, and they're about to be in swamp, and we don't know what to do. And when Jesus wakes up, he doesn't go, oh, Peter, breathe. Andrew, chill. John, relax. He does not tell them, calm down. And you know, that's significant because how many times is telling somebody calm down work? Never. <laughs> It never works. In a state of panic, when you tell somebody, calm down, they don't calm down. And the disciples, they were in a state of sheer terror and words alone telling them, calm down, would not have done anything. So thank Jesus. Jesus does not get up and say, y'all, calm down. He doesn't tell them to calm down. He addresses the root of their fear, which is the storm itself. He turns to the root of what is causing them to panic, and he addresses that situation. He rebukes the wind, and he commands the sea, peace be still. And as we have heard from our psalm, this is God. And just as God had calmed the seas before, God in Jesus can do it now. He immediately brings calm to the situation, because he has authority over creation. And by calming the storm, Jesus removes the fear, the root of the fear of the disciples. He's not just a comforting presence. He's a powerful savior who can control the elements and who wishes to address the root of the problem. In our own lives, we face situations that fill us with fear and anxiety. And like the disciples, telling us, calm down, telling us, pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, telling us to do anything else but address the root of the problem is not enough. No. Jesus says, I will address the root of the problem. I will address the root of the thing that is causing our fear. He shows us he has the power to do just that. He's not just offering these words that will placate us. He's taken action to bring peace into a chaotic situation. He is more than just a teacher. He is greater than that. And when we invite Jesus into our storms, we're not just seeking his presence, but we're also asking for intervention. He has the ability to speak peace into our lives and transform our circumstances. Because when we see God fully, we can trust God deeply. And I think also he's telling us to help each other out too, not just tell each other calm down, but help each other address the root of the thing that is causing our fear. And they're beginning to see, they're beginning to see that he is something else than just this human being. He says to them, why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Okay, so here's something to pay attention to. And I know we have hot dogs on our mind, but listen to this, because this is a powerful moment. The author of Mark is addressing two types of fear here. Jesus, Jesus asks them, why are you afraid? Have you, have you still no faith? That word afraid comes from a, a word fear. In Greek, that means delos. It's, it's, called, it's delos, that's a Greek word. And that means cowardice or timidity. It's a, it's a type of fear that causes you to be paralyzed in, from action. Right? It makes you so fearful that you cannot move. And it did paralyze them. They forgot they had each other. 
They forgot that there were some of them there who were experienced fishermen. They forgot there were other people on boats around them that could support them and console them and help them. They also forgot who Jesus really is. Yes, he is human. Yes, he was tired. Yes, he was smelly. Yes, he was hungry. But he's also the divine one, the incarnation of God who created the earth by calming the chaos of the waters. The second fear is phobos. The Greek word is phobos. And that is the fear that the disciples felt, not during the storm, but after seeing Jesus perform this miracle. That phobos, you probably think of the word phobia, but that phobos is an awe. It's a terror ex uh, that you experience from encountering something so powerful and external that it wants to move you. They are beginning to see who Jesus is. They are moving from that paralyzed fear, that fear that caused them to feel all alone, that fear to make them feel that they could do nothing to that full boss of, oh my goodness, this, there's something greater here. There's something that is moving us here. They're beginning to fully see who he is. He is the son of God calming a storm. He is more than the person that they took on their boat just as he was. I've often wondered, why did they wake him up? I mean, if they were surprised, and if they were fearful that he could calm the seas, then they clearly didn't expect him to do that, right? So why did they wake him up? What did they want from him? Did they just want him to show his concern? Did they just want him to wake up and participate in this chaos with them? Did they want him to pray to God for them? When Jesus asked them, why are they thelos? Why are you afraid? Why are you paralyzed with fear? I don't think this was an angry rebuke at all. I think he was telling them after he took away the root of their problem, mind you, not while they were struggling in this chaos, but after, when all was calm, he asked them to think about it. Asked them to think about why were you paralyzed with fear? You were never alone. You have each other. You have people in the boat, but not in a fix yourselves kind of moment, but you have community. You will always have community, and you will always have God with you. I think he was reminding them that, that you are never as alone as you feel. That sometimes God is more than just a good teacher. In fact, all the time, God is more than a good teacher. The Jesus that they saw, the one who got hangry, the one who was sleepy, the one who needed a bath, was also fully divine, is also fully divine. He's the God of Scripture who could calm the seas and still the winds as he has done in the past. He may have gone with them just as he was, but given their circumstances, Jesus is more than enough. It's a reminder of whose they are. They are people of God and who he is, the Son of God. And I think sometimes just knowing you're not alone, knowing that God is with you, is a step in the right direction given your circumstances. If you were to reflect on the personal and collective storms that you face today, it's understandable if you're going to ask yourself, is Jesus enough? I hope today is a reminder for you that Jesus is more than just a great teacher. Jesus is more than someone we can sing inspirational songs about. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the one who came to show us that radical, inclusive love that the kingdom is all about. And Jesus is inviting you into that radical, inclusive kingdom as well. Jesus is saying, this is who I am, and I am for everybody. And it's to that kingdom that we are invited to bring our fears and trust his authority. And we don't have to be pelos. We don't have to be paralyzed in fear because we can see him fully and we can see other people around us in our boat and on that storm sea as well. And then we can change that into a phobos, a reverent awe of his power and presence. By encountering Jesus in our storms, our faith is built up to counter that internal fear that leaves us feeling paralyzed helps us to remember we are never alone. No, it won't remove our storms. We know that. 
but hopefully it will move us to a place of peace and strength. If you would take away one thing today, I want you to encourage, I want to encourage you to see God's kingdom as one in which you can come as you are into that boat, just as Jesus came to that boat, just as he was with your fears, so that you could see God fully and trust God deeply, that you can move from Thelos to Phobos. And here's a practical step. Maybe you can do, if it's for you, to start a record, a journal of, of your fears and your prayers and note how God responds over time. Or maybe start noting mentally or in a journal where you see God at work in nature or in song or in people. Because that will take away the chaos that others want to throw into our safe spaces. That will help us build faith that God is with us and not asleep. And why does it matter? It matters because we are living in times that seem like there is one storm after the other that is spilling to our safe spaces. Our boats are being filled with chaos. And we might be wondering if Jesus is enough or if he is just asleep. We can come disillusioned. We can come become dejected. We can become apathetic to the needs of ourselves or others. See God fully. Trust God, Jesus deeply. Remember, you're not alone in your boat. You're not alone on your stormy sea. I'm going to invite you to reflect on your own life and how you see Jesus in it. Just for a second, close your eyes. Think of one storm you're currently facing. Do you feel as though you are the only one in the boat? Do you feel like you're the only one on the stormy sea? Is Jesus someone who climbed into your boat of life just as he was? Now envision Jesus standing in your boat, fully divine, commanding the wind and the sea to be still. Imagine your thelos turn into phobos. See that you are not alone. See your paralyzing fear move away to awe and wonder. Amen.